Good morning. Welcome to Turfcrest Epistemology. I'm Travis Shaddix. Thank you for coming today. A little bit uh, gray and wet this morning in Lexington, Kentucky. It's March 26th. But I think today's the day that it's going to really start kicking in for those cool season grasses in my area. Last night it was above 57, 58 degrees all, all night long. It um, rained and sort of drizzled last night. It's going to be drizzling sort of a little bit um, up to about lunchtime today. And then the rest of the week it's going to be sunny. I saw some landscape uh, companies out this weekend mowing some grass. And I think it's really going to start kicking in now. Um, it seems a little early, but it's a little warmer than normal. And, uh, you know, you, I guess today's the day, I should say. I actually put out a little bit of nitrogen on my lawn yesterday, which is unusual for me. I don't really do that that much, but I started a study yesterday um, that included nitrogen and some other components in the, in the treatments. And, um, it was on, it's on my lawn. It's going to be on my lawn for a long time. <laughs> and I thought, oh, what the heck, I'll go ahead and put out some nitrogen on the rest of my lawn. So I hit it just right. I put it out and it's just been sort of a little bit moist and drizzling, not raining hard at all, but just a little bit of rain. And, uh, so I think it's good timing. Uh, so hopefully if you're not started, you're thinking about getting started real quick on some applications and some, uh, maintenance if you're mowing. You know, for those cool season grasses in, you know, Tennessee and Kentucky and that general transition zone, it's, I think it's going to start kicking in real fast. It's already growing. I've already cut my lawn once or twice, but, um, ideal conditions are right around the corner. So it's that time of year. Good morning, Connecticut. You want to can? You say you like the guitar music, but it's not really your style. That's cool. Yeah, no problem. Got a little bit of a different song today the end of the show good morning looney jack cop i think it's cop the way you would say that good morning super ta brady brady says he missed yesterday but he watched it later that's great however however you want to get it <laughs> internet surfer randy from bulgaria hello louis carta louis carta from south carolina King Khan says, good morning, I really do appreciate your knowledge when it comes to stuff like this and breaking it down because it helps the DIYers to get a better understanding. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Well, there's a lot of DIYers, a lot of lawn care operators. There's a few golf course superintendents and a few athletic turf people. I don't know any saw producers are listening yet, but try to tailor it to everybody. There's quite a bit of lawn style information that I've been going over. But um, occasionally there's putting green stuff I go over. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, I try to cover all four industries of the turf grass, which are saw production, sport turf, lawns, and golf. Today we have an article that's unfortunately a little mm, below average. <laughs> so, but we'll get to it. Um, but yeah, I started a study yesterday. It's a soil test philosophy study. I've been working on it for a year or so, trying to get it going in multiple states, and it was already going in a different state. And I tried to get a couple other colleagues on. I don't, I know, I think they were going to be starting it, but I don't know if they ever actually started it. But I started mine yesterday, and it'll go for a, quite a long time. And it was very interesting the treatments that went out because it depends on the soil test interpretation that that uh, determines the application. And I'll just say this is that a. Uh, I did one of the treatments as a home test and the home test and it, the, the plots are all in, one, all in my yard. They're all randomized properly and everything's all legit and it's all from the same yard. The home test had a recommendation of four different fertilizers, completely different. One had high potassium, one had high phosphorus, one had no phosphorus. One, I mean, it was just all over the place all from the same soil so um we'll see how it goes who knows what the results will come out i'll probably end up putting out some results after the first year a little bit and then i'll pub try to maybe publish it after two years but i may i don't know i may end up just running it permanently and while i'm here who knows how long i'll run it but it'll be interesting <clears throat> good morning ignacio 
let's go to the scoreboard, but the potassium scoreboard. We've gone over a number of a, a number of papers. I don't know, nine, ten, eleven papers, whatever it is now, and whatever I can't. You, know, you can do the math on the on the sheet here. There's probably nine that show nothing happened, or um, when potassium was applied to turf grass. There's seven looks like that had a negative result when potassium was applied, and now there's five that show a positive result. Okay. So the positive results are specific, and I want to make sure we clarify this, is that the positive results that have occurred so far, at least, have come on low K soils, soils that do not have potassium bearing minerals in them for the most part. And um, the response came at the lowest rate of potassium. So whether it was from Schmidt or from Snyder and Cesar or from Sartain or whoever it was that did the study, they had, if they had varying rates of potassium in the study, the mac the the uh, maximum amount of response and oftentimes the 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 ceiling of the response occurred from when no potassium was applied to simply applying the lowest level of potassium which is generally around half the amount of nitrogen and somewhere depending on where you live somewhere between 1 pound to maybe 1 and a half pounds of k annually that's going to depend on where you apply it and you know so forth but generally that's where the maximum response occurs, and any further application of potassium didn't result in, in a concomitant increase in turf response. So I want to make sure that's clear is that these these positive responses that whoops the positive responses um, have occurred on under specific scenarios. Low K, usually the turf grass is being removed, the clippings are being removed when they heart when they mow. Um, and the Positive responses come from not much, not not that much potassium, just a little bit. Okay, we're going to show one today. I have done here. You'll see done here. The initial soil K uh, is unknown in this study. They didn't identify the the potassium level in the soil, um, but I'm going to get to that. But you can see over here on the initial soil potassium levels in many of these studies, it's 10 parts per million malic one, 10 parts per million malic one, or 18 parts per million malic three. There's one up here that's 23 parts per million malic three, another one that's 10 parts per a million malic one, and there's all sorts of varying initial levels of potassium in the soil, but they're usually quite low you know, in the studies that showed a response to, to applying potassium. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. Don't expect a positive response to applying potassium on soils that are already quite high in extractable potassium. It's extremely rare that that would ever happen okay so in that regard it's it you it's almost you, you could make an argument that you should take a soil test just to confirm you don't need to apply any <laughs> i mean if it's you know 50 60 parts per million per million malic three or greater your chances are essentially zero you're not really ever going to see a positive response when your malic three potassium is that high so I mean, if you're applying potassium and you're listening and you say, well, I understand, but I don't want to take that risk. So I'll go ahead and take a soil test to confirm how high my potassium is so that I can eliminate it. I have confidence in eliminating it. That would probably be a good reason to take a soil test. Because if you're in the, if you have three digits on that potassium extractable level, like a hundred or greater parts per million, or even a hundred or greater pounds per acre, because then it would still be 50 parts per million in that case. You don't need to apply any potassium. There's you have almost no chance of having any return on that investment in potassium. So, um, so that would be a good reason to soil test to to confirm you don't need to apply it. Good morning, Alexander Thomas. That sounds like a new name to me. I apologize if you've been here before. But there's so many people I I can't remember everybody's name. It says you're going to have a relaxing lawn season this year. Oh, thanks to me. Okay, <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. I'm not sure what I did, but. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of like, I mean, it's going to sound, I don't know how this is going to sound, but it's kind of like anything that anybody does that's, who's someone who's really, really good at something. Like, let's say, let's say you see someone playing the piano or something. You're like, man, they make it look so easy. Well, like, cause they've been doing it for decades. They spent their 10,000 hours doing it and it looks easy, but believe me, it's not. Or, you know athletics you see someone excelling in athletics you know 
And he's like, oh, they they looks like they're running so easy. They're so relaxed when they're running. How they how they look so relaxed? Well, it's because they are relaxed. They've been doing it for a very long time. It's the same thing like this. I mean, it's not that complicated. I mean, the the nutrient management component of turf grass management is only complicated when marketing and sales gets involved because they have to create problems to convince you to buy something. But in reality, it's not overly complex. Remember, it's the water, the light, the temperature, and the, the, the injury to the turf that comes first. And all those things, once they get in balance or once they're properly, you know, at optimum levels, the only part left is a soil fertility component. And that's the very minor fraction of what's really influencing the turf. And actually, I'm going to show that in this paper. The overriding message in today's paper is to um, recognize the impact of light compared to potassium. Okay, and you're going to see that in today's paper. The light influence is far more influential than the potassium was. And so once you get everything in optimum levels, you know, you've, you've addressed those higher priority issues, risks, like water, like light, you know, like weeds and insect damage and so forth. The nutrient component is fairly straightforward. <clears throat> it's a, it's a, uh, a reasonable and evidence-based amount of nitrogen, the type of nitrogen, the rate and the timing of that nitrogen. It's a reasonable amount of that. And then all the other stuff, the phosphorus, and potassium, iron, uh, um, many times that's not needed. I mean, sometimes clearly they are needed. I mean, I'm not saying that it'll never happen. There's clear cases where phosphorus is deficient. There's clear cases where potassium is deficient and so forth. But it's not, it's not by any, by any stretch, the imagination, the more, the common situation. It's not that common that you're going to have, you know, blanket across the board phosphorus deficiencies that would warrant apl applying phosphorus at these levels. And the same thing with potassium. So, you know, it just, I mean, it, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear you, you know, a relaxing lawn care when you say that, Alexander and Thomas, because it, it, it should be that way. It, it should be, it's not, it's not overly complicated. The, the difficult part is the non-agricultural part in lawn management and, and, and business, turf grass industry. It's the people, and the labor and the budgets and the, you know, all that stuff. I mean, maybe it's easy to other people. Maybe they do that for a living. But for me, that's the difficult part how to keep people employed, how to keep them motivated. You know, all that stuff's, that's, that's very difficult in my view. But the, the agricultural component is, you know, let's keep it simple. And it, it usually is simple. It's only complicated when you, whenever you start going down these, these roads of, I got to buy, you know, humic acids because they're going to change the world. And I got to buy, you know, seaweed extract and worm juice and all this other stuff it's going to do all this fancy stuff that that's when epistemologically you've you've deviated from from the approach right um you know you've been turned into a direction that is you know oftentimes what marketing and sales want you to do they want you they want you to move away from the the problem and think about solutions I mean, these are all solutions and solutions and solutions. It, it was Einstein. Was an, uh, maybe I'm wrong. I believe it was Einstein that said if he was given an hour to solve a problem, he would spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about the solution. And I completely agree. I mean, I, didn't, it's, I haven't ever heard it said so succinctly, but if you think about the problems, you'll recognize... All these marketed solutions are unnecessary because the problem is probably water or light or temperature or injury. And in the soil, the problem is probably just a lack of nitrogen occasionally. You know, the solutions are what marketing wants you to focus on, not the problems. Because if you think about the problems and you focus on the problems and give some time to thought, what, what, what is actually causing this? I'm seeing an, un an unacceptable turf grass. That's a problem. Okay, think about that. What is causing that problem? What's likely to be causing, you know, what I'm what I'm observing, and instead of thinking, oh, this humic acid is going to solve my problem, this seaweed extract is going to solve my problem. <laughs> it's a solution. I'm going to put it out. It's going to solve my shade problems. 
It's going to reduce all the stress problem. Well, maybe that maybe you didn't even have those problems at all. So think about the problem, and it usually kind of things sort of just you know become easier when you when you when you recognize exactly what the problem is. You know, once you determine that, the chances of you of the solution being some bizarre product or some strange management practice is highly unusual. And it goes back to like the the whether it's basketball or football or whatever, it's it's not these, you know, fancy, crazy plays and trick plays and fancy athleticism that, that usually win championships. They might win, you know, a game. They might win a quarter. They might get a first down, right? But championships are won on the fundamentals, right? And in, in agronomy and turf grass science, I think acceptable turf grass is achieved least expensively by by focusing on the fundamentals, the fundamentals of agronomy. That will help, you know, greatly enhance your efficient turf grass management programs. Okay. Anyway, that's my soapbox speech for today on that. Let's get to the the article. I'm just gonna say before I even bring it up <laughs> that the, the article was written by some of my former colleagues, and I think it was one of their graduate students. I don't know if it was a female or a male graduate student. Um, I don't even know if it was a graduate student. Um, but I don't know the main author, the, the first author. And I, I'll just say that every, everybody who writes is eventually going to write a clunker. I mean, eventually <laughs> you're going to put out something that's a little bit like, what? What happened? That doesn't seem right. And I think that's what this paper is. This paper's a little bit of a of a whoopsie daisy in the world of of turf grass publications. So, but there's some good information we can glean from it. Matt D asks in chat, "Do you think it's beneficial to apply 5 10 31 in September on Bermuda?" Well, with all due respect, I think that's the wrong question, Matt D. So I can say with a great deal of, uh, of confidence that it will be beneficial. Yes, I'm not. I'm not so much interested in whether or not a product is only beneficial, though. What I'm interested in is, will the is the application of that product the most efficient form of solving a problem? Right. So because it has five percent nitrogen in there. There's, it's extremely likely that the product like that applied at the right rate in the right time would be beneficial. <clears throat> but my further interest would be, do you really need to apply the phosphorus and the potassium? Because if you don't need to apply the phosphorus and potassium, then it would be a, a beneficial application, but it would be a very wasteful application. Not only because it has phosphorus in it and that can actually harm our environment or increase our environmental risk, but because it costs money. So whether or not you're environmentalist or capitalist and whether if you keep those two things separate is, is it's the same argument in this case, you know, it's a wasteful, it, well, I don't know in this case, I don't know what you, your situation, but it can be wasteful if it's not needed or it is wasteful if it's not needed, the phosphorus and potassium. So that wastes your money. And if you're applying nitrogen or phosphorus in a wasteful manner, then that increases environmental risk. So in this case, it, it meets both, it checks both boxes, environmental and financial so i i i have my i'm skeptical as to whether a 5 10 31 would actually be needed but i would need to know is there a phosphorus and potassium deficiency that would warrant that amount of phosphorus and potassium before i would apply it so jack cop and if i'm mispronouncing your name jack please let me know i'm gonna, I'm gonna pronounce it jack cop unless you tell me differently he asks i'm curious if you're concerned that going to the membership model will impact your goal of making a difference in the turf grass community since less people will be seeing your videos yeah that's an interesting question i mean fewer people would see the video live if it's under memberships that that's i'm assuming that's true i can i mean right now there's three members in here four or four members one two three five members in chat out of maybe uh, 22 people here and um so likely there'll be fewer people watching live as a membership model that's true 
But those, mo- those videos will still be released at some point in the future. So while I'm putting out five or four, four episodes a week right now, this is, by the way, the last week that I'm putting out four episodes to the public um, in one week. Um, next week, or in April, I'm going to start put, doing two a week. So that'll reduce the, the content and give me time to catch up on some stuff. Um, but am I, am I concerned about that? I mean, I, I guess, I mean, there's some concern there that I would have less of an impact because it's behind a, a member paywall, but my, my, I guess my concern about that is not greater than my interest in providing greater value to the members. So if you're a member, then you already know that you've seen all these videos that are being released daily. They've been up there for a month behind the membership wall and you can go look at all those videos there's also a community tab where i've been communicating with members and letting them know what i'm doing posting photos of my research and chit chatting with them on the community tab i think that's additional value that um you know if you're willing to pay for that then you're getting that and then what i'm going to do jack is for the members who are willing to to contribute to the um, to the channel, I'll have a Zoom meeting that's not recorded and not published and not put out anywhere, just to enhance and to increase our our community, our turfgrass community among those turf professionals and DIYers that want to have a little bit more just camaraderie face to face on Zoom. I'll probably do that once every two months or once a month. The first one will be in April, and I'll post that under the member chat member tab in my community. So, um. So, I mean, there'll be fewer people watch live. That's true. I'm sure that's true, Jack. But I don't know. I mean, I, uh, to be frank, Jack, I'm, I've told this before. I'm surprised anybody watches this channel. <laughs> I don't, I don't, un, I mean, you, you, I'm not sound like a broken record for those people who have been on, on the channel for a long time. I, I don't, I, I, I'm clearly, I was wrong. But initially I told my wife, no one's going to watch this. I mean, who would be interested in listening about turf research? I mean, I don't, I don't understand that, but clearly I was wrong. And, um, so anyway, that's my spiel on that. I, 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 I guess I'm concerned about it, but I do this for fun. I'm glad it helps people. It does motivate me. I, I, I think I've already had probably an equal or greater impact doing this in six months than I did in university levels for over six years. I mean, it's, it's nuts. And the data is here to support it. It's it's bizarre. I've never seen anything like it. So um, so I thank all those people who who choose to support the channel. And if you don't really want to, I've said this before. If you don't really keen, you're not going to really participate in the membership level on the channel, but you just want to contribute to Turfgrass Research, then that's the the revenue from the channel will help support Turfgrass Research as well. So, but don't but Jack don't don't be worried about not getting the content. You'll get the content. It'll just be you won't get it live. The, that that Monday morning show won't be live. The Thursday evening show, which is by far the greatest attended show, there's 40 plus people on the show, uh, watching the show every Thursday night. Um, I suspect that that attendance might increase because I'm only doing it once a week, and so people might might show up. So you can make an argument either way. But good question. Um. Oh, the, so the grass factor asks. Since you've gone to the membership model, will you make sure to promote your channel more often? Yeah, probably not. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> when you say promote my channel, I don't even know what that means. Okay, <laughs> I mean, you have to understand, and you'll understand this more in May when I get to the, to the Mental Health Awareness Month. I'm wired mentally in a certain way, and it's in, I try to, to deviate from that. I try to get better at what I'm doing. I try to be a better person, a better human each day. I try to do that. But I'm wired science-wise in a certain fashion, and it's difficult for me to kind of understand how to, all the social media stuff works and how to promote myself and how to promote the channel. I don't know any of that. Um, you know, it, it is what it is. I, I don't know what else to say <laughs> other than I enjoy talking to this. I enjoy knowing that my, my content helps you all, and it seems like it's having a beneficial impact on the industry. But as far as like promoting it and generating revenue. I don't really care so much about that as I do about the impact. So, um, I mean, I'm glad it's able to support itself. It looks like that's what's going to happen real soon if it's not already, but I I need help with that, to be honest. I don't know if anybody's willing to kind of give me two cents on how to promote the channel. Let me know. 
I don't know. Oh yeah, so Jack says he didn't know the videos would eventually be available. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll it'll be live for the members, and then I'll, at some point a week or two later, what I'm planning on doing is having that membership only video. It'll give me a chance to like edit out the first and the last part and kind of condense it maybe, and post like the 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 what was broadcasted live and then the sections of it individually if I need to do that for people that just want to catch like five minutes or ten minutes of it. So. Oh, the Grass Factor says you'll promote the, my channel at your. Uh, it says we will at the Grass Factor. We will promote your channel more. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing on this on in terms of like YouTube promotions and generating interest in the channel or whatever. I'm all, you know whatever. I, I'm just not good at that. I mean, you know, one of the best signs of of uh being at well, I, well i'll just shut up <laughs> i don't want to go down that road right now but i'm just not i'm good at some things and i'm not good at other things and that's one thing i'm not good at is knowing how to promote stuff and promote myself and promote the channel uh, and you'll understand that in may I'll, I'll get to that in may i'm going to go down the whole this whole report and hopefully it makes more sense as to my peculiarities and my issues that i've had okay Let's get into the the article. This article is entitled, let me get this up, uh, is entitled Response of Captiva St. Augustine Grass to Shade and Potassium. And this was written by, I can't pronounce the, the person's name. I think she's Chi he or she is Chinese. I, I don't know how to pronounce the person's name. I, I apologize. Um, but, and I, I had, I've had a Chinese, I've had two Chinese students and I, and I know if I try to pronounce that, it's going to be, I'm going to butcher the heck out of it. So I'm just going <laughs> to say that the first author is, um, whoever he or she is, and then by Dr. Trenholm, Cruz, and Sartain are the, are the co-authors on this. So this was done at the University of Florida. And um, so these, these three authors are my past colleagues, and this was published in 2011. And um, I'll just say, <laughs> it's just, it, the, I wouldn't have a whole lot of confidence in the results of this study. I'll just say that. Okay, and I suspect that they probably don't either, to be honest. But I'm going to go through the article. There's a little bit of information we can pull out of this. I'm going to show almost all the results in a PowerPoint. But I want to make sure it's clear is that Hort Science is a good journal. It's a top, it's a top tier journal in our industry. It's a it's a quality journal. Um, this paper could have used a little extra help. I'll just say that. Okay, so it was published in Hort Science in 2011. You can go to Hort, uh, you can go to ashs.org, American Society of Horticultural Sciences.org right now and download this for free. It's completely free. You can download the whole thing and read it for free. And um, so you can read along with us if you want to. <clears throat> All right, here we go. So St. Augustine grass is widely used as a warm season turf grass. This is one of the most popular turf grass species used for home lawns throughout the southern United States. St. Augustine grass has better shade tolerance than many other warm season grasses. Okay. That's very likely true. I mean, the goat, the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, you know, you know, the, 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 the hard part about turf or the, you know, the, you know, the, um, I'm trying to think of the word. Anyway, they did the, if, if anybody can figure out a way to grow warm season grass under the shade, you would be instantaneously, you know, a, a gazillionaire consistently because it's you just can't grow Bermuda grass in the shade. St. Augustine grass can grow in the shade better, but it still suffers under deep shade, like especially in Florida where there's a lot of live oaks that have huge, broad, you know, uh, branches and this thick, dense shade. And, then, and the live oaks there for 150 years or whatever, it's you, you, you're just not going to grow grass in that much shade. It's not easy. But St. Augustine grass will grow better than some other gra um, warm season grasses so and i'm not a, i'm not a saint augustine grass fan i'm not real sure why it's taken over so much in florida because there's plenty of other grasses that would do well there the bahia grass and by the way it's bahia grass because there's something on um another channel where he was making fun of saying it uh, in a different way but just so we're clear bahia, bahia grass is from brazil okay and i just happened to be sleeping next to a brazilian and so she pronounces it bahia Okay, and if you look it up on on Google and Google, I was pronouncing Bahia grass, but it says Bahia grass, so it's you don't pronounce the H; it's Bahia grass. 
So let's try to pronounce that correctly. It's from Brazil. They they say you wouldn't say when you look at the word Bra when you pronounce the word Brazil, you don't say Brazil. You say Brazil because that's the way they pronounce it, even though it's with an S. You pronounce it with a Z. So they you know let's use their pronunciation. It's Bahia grass. Anyway, I digress. Um, but Bahia grass is one of the most common lawn grasses in Florida because so many of the lawn grasses in Florida are in large um, fields. I mean. You know, but the normal communities have St. Augustine grass. I'm not sure why it's so common there, but I will say that it, it is good for like masking weed uh, weed populations. It has such a broad leaf that you, it's very difficult to see things like crabgrass and nut sedge and stuff that you would see very easily on like one inch mowed Bermuda grass. And so the average homeowner, there's, their, their, their lawns are probably loaded with weeds, but they don't really complain. And I don't think they would complain as much um with st Augustine grass then compared to bermuda grass where it's an eye sore it's obvious that you have a weed out there so there are some adaptations bermuda grass is highly susceptible to nematodes in the sandy soils of florida whereas st Augustine grass doesn't have quite as a problem with that so there are some benefits but i'm not a big st Augustine grass fan i don't like the way it looks it's too coarse and thick but all the everybody puts it in in florida except for me i put in 419 in my lawn <laughs> anyway Okay, there are management strategies to improve turf grass performance under shade, including increasing mowing height, reducing nitrogen fertilization and irrigation, and applications of growth regulators. I don't know why, um, I'm not sure why, occasionally this concept will come up where, oh, the, the turf grass isn't growing well under the shade, so I'm going to apply more nitrogen to it so it grows better. You don't want to do that. I, I, that came up one uh, a month or two ago on some forum. And I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why that makes sense to some people. I mean, I guess because it's not growing well, you think you need to apply nitrogen to make it grow more. I'm, I'm not sure why that is, but you don't want to do that. Okay, you, you know, you you want to apply fewer nutrients when when it's under the shade. Okay, so it even says right here. You know, the the strategy is to reduce nitrogen fertilization, and he has they have a a citation here, and that's pretty consistent in the literature. You don't want to apply more nutrients to turf grass that's growing in the shade. And you don't want to mow it lower. You want to generally mow, increase, right here, it's, he says it, increase the mowing height, reduce the nitrogen fertilization and the irrigation. Okay, those are, those are strategies that you can use when growing turf grass in the shade. I haven't gone into a lot of that, but those are a couple, two or three strategies that you can use to help reduce the risk of problems. It doesn't mean it's going to suddenly turn your turf around. And it's going to be great growing in the shade. Like I said, it's, it's warm season grass in the shade, even cool season grass in deep shade. It's never going to reach its full potential. So don't expect miracles. But if you want to increase the chances of having supple turf, increase the mowing height, reduce the fertilization of nitrogen, and reduce the irrigation, those things help. Potassium has been shown to enhance turf grass resistance to biotic and environmental stresses. I wish they'd quit quoting Turner and Hummel 92. Because... um. The, yeah, see that, yeah, I mean, it's not that strong of a citation and everybody seems to use it. It's not, if you're going to make these, uh, these claims that it does, potassium results in these benefits, which we've shown many times it doesn't, many times it actually harm, potassium harms the turf grass. Now we're showing a few things where there is a benefit, but we, when we say things, when we assert things with such confidence, we better have more, more citations than just some abstract from 1992 at a meeting or something. So it's, I wouldn't, when they say this, don't have, I don't, I don't have a lot of confidence that this is going to occur. Okay. It can occur under certain conditions, as we mentioned at the beginning of the episode today, low K, removing clippings and so forth. It can additionally aid in the production of starches, promote root growth and assist in stomatal regulation. And they have one citation 1990 for that. Stomatal regulation is clear. That's in the literature. But to say that, you know, it promotes root growth and then you say it with such a, you know, confidence, like, well, there, there's occasions where it may, there's many occasions where it won't. <laughs> so how do you know it's going to in your case? Anyway, Captiva is a new dwarf cultivar. This was, again, this was in 2011, a new dwarf cultivar, St. Augustine grass that is characterized by dark green, short, narrow leaf blades and reduced vertical leaf extension. Cap okay. So I will say this, there's another, there's a couple of new cultivars of St. Augustine grass coming out from, from a number of universities, but from Florida, from um, Dr. Kenworthy at Florida. And there's one called, I don't, I think they call it Citra Blue. I can't, I, I think that's what they call it. I, 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 I did work with it when it was a number. And 
it has a very different growth habit than St. Then floor Tam or Palmetto or anything else. Very different growth habit. It's much dense, much more dense, much darker green and much more stoloniferous. It has, it's very, very thatchy and, uh, it looks really good. I mean, it looks great in the, in, in terms of the quality compared to other, ter- other St. Austin grasses. But the reason I'm saying that is, is because when we compare, uh, when we start, when we introduce new turf grass varieties and, and, you know, Dr. Kenworthy can correct me if I'm wrong. We almost never know or never do a, a, a correlation or a regression of nitrogen requirements, phosphorus requirements, potassium requirements on those new cultivars. We just release them and you expect everybody to maintain them the same way. Okay. And I think what's going to happen is, especially with this newer cultivar coming out of Florida, where it's so green and so low to the ground, it grows so much lower to the ground than everything else, that we're probably gonna end up having some challenges with it because people are gonna keep putting on the nutrients as they did with, with Floortam, and we don't need to. I bet money that the nitrogen requirements of that new cultivar out of Florida is half the rate of Floortam. I bet, it's, I bet you don't need to apply even half the amount of nitrogen to that, that, that cultivar to result in an acceptable turf grass. So when they say that here, it's characterized by dark green short leaf blades and reduced vertical leaf. They're talking about this particular cultivar called Captiva. And there are differences between these cultivars, particularly in St. Augustine grass, where you're dealing with the old common one or the old floor tan varieties and uh, versus some of these dwarf varieties that are much more improved. So we need to be aware that when you step on a lawn, if you're in Florida or South Carolina or Texas or wherever these, you know, common and you have, you know, Joe Smith going out there and just blasting the fertilizer out at Mach 9 across 10, you know, lawns. And he runs into one that's a dwarf. I'm not saying you would have problems. I'm just saying that you might get by with hardly any nutrients of that. And applying more and more nutrients, it might not be helpful. And in fact, we might find out in the future it might be harmful. I don't know. That's the point. No one knows because we don't release these cultivars with a set, with knowledge of what the nutrient requirements are sometimes. We continue. However, there is little science-based knowledge about responses of Captiva St. Augustine grass to shade and potassium. So here's an example of where they did do some work on Captiva, or the new cultivar. This information could provide useful information for management of Captiva under shaded conditions. The objective of the study was to evaluate the response of Captiva to shade and potassium levels and determine if potassium applications could enhance tolerance of Captiva to shade conditions. Now, and, and on Calendly, I counseled with some, uh, someone last week or week before last, about some potassium in Florida. This particular person was in Polk County, and which was where I used to work. And um, he, he was asking about potassium. And I told him that it is possible, I don't have a lot of confidence in it, but it's possible that the application of potassium in, under the right conditions in Florida may result in a beneficial response to, in, to St. Austin grass when it's grown under sh- heavy shade, shaded conditions. It's possible. I, um, I told him that with a lot of skepticism, I, I wouldn't have a lot of confidence in it, but it is possible. And this paper is why I told him that. Okay. I don't, again, I don't have a lot of confidence in this particular paper, but it, it is in the literature. There is a little bit here that we can glean from this. So I wouldn't ever say it wouldn't help in the shade. I would just say that it's possible under the right conditions. Okay. But I wouldn't have a lot of confidence in it. Okay, so that's the, that's the study. We're going to go into the materials and methods now. Two consecutive experiments were conducted in a climate-controlled greenhouse at the Envirotron in, at the University of Florida in Gainesville. The first experiment was conducted... The Envirotron, by the way, is like a greenhouse complex that's dedicated only to turf grass research. The first experiment was conducted from 20 May through 24th of October in 2009, and the second from 18 January to June 20th in 2010. Okay, so they did two greenhouse experiments back-to-back years. In May of 2009, Captiva St. Augustine grass was established in plastic pots. And here's the, here's the, the soil. Media of 50% of Fard 2 mix. I don't even know what that is. Um, a Fard 2 mix. I guess that's like a, a soil mix. And 50% sand, which was came from this from Interlochen, Florida, or you. So it was a blend of sand and this mixture. And they don't they're not going to tell me or you what the nutrient contents of the soil mixture was. So I don't know what the potassium content was, but I suspect 
with as much sand in there, it might, it might have been low, but I don't know. I mean, they don't say it. During establishment, grasses were kept in full sunlight under conditions of optimal irrigation until all plots had established uniform cover, density, and shoot growth. There was no fertilization during establishment, and grasses were mowed at, uh, what is that, two and a half inches, two and a half inches before initiation of treatments. So they put them in pots with a blend of sand and probably soil, far, far too mix, whatever that is. And they let the turf grass establish fully in full sun before they started the study. And they didn't apply any nutrients so there wouldn't be any residual in the pots that once they started, probably that's probably why they did it. Shade treatments were provided by poly, polyvinyl chloride structures covered with woven black shade cloth to supply 30, 50, and 70% shade from full sunlight. Okay. There were four potassium treatments, 0 0.1, 0 0.25, and 0 0.5 uh, uh, pounds of potassium were applied. Potassium treatments were applied as KCL, which is good, every 30 days. So those are the rates they're applied every 30 days. They applied 0 0.1, a quarter pound, or a half a pound of K every month throughout the study period. Shade and potassium treatments were initiated on June 18th in trial one and February 15th in trial two. Okay, so we're going to finish the materials and methods, and I'm going to, at the end, I'm going to kind of explain why this study is a little bit questionable. During the treatment period, turf visual quality was rated twice a month for turf quality, color, and density. Turf quality was based on one to nine, with six being minimal. Uh, shoot growth was measured once a month by mowing each plot with scissors. At the termination of each study, leaves were measured for leaf, leaf, leaf length and width. Clipping, clippings were harvested and they measured uh, or nitrogen using TK or total Keldol nitrogen and potassium concentrations. Tissue samples were dry. Okay. Uh, now, here we go. Okay. So, all, for all my graduate students uh, who might still be out there and graduate students listening who are at other universities and even professors, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to read this next sentence, and I'm going to give pretty much everybody a pass who's done this in the past, but from moving forward, by moving forward from, from well, hopefully you've never done it, but if you have done it and you're continuing to do it, moving forward, we need to, we need to refrain from this model, okay, because it's not a model, okay? The experimental design was a nested design with four replications. Now, what is a nested design? A nested design is the equivalent of taking, let, let's say you have your lawn, or let's say you have a football field, and let's say uh, the end zone was seashore past Palem, and let's say the 0 to 50 yard line on one side of the field was Bermuda, and then the 50 to the 0 yard line on the other side of the field was zoysia grass, and then the opposite end zone was, um, you know, whatever, you know, bent grass or whatever, some other, or some other warm season grass, okay? And you conducted a study that was one whole study on this grass and another study on that, that grass and another study on that grass and another study on the other grass. So you have the same exact study and you have it on diff the different parts of the field, but within a complete grass. Then instead of analyzing all those studies individually, you group them together and you compare grasses. Can't do that. That's called a nested design and it's not a valid statistical model. And there's many publications on that, and there's books on agricultural science written by University of Florida faculty, who's, you know, his name's Ed Zerd, and he's unbelievably, unbelievably knowledgeable in agricultural statistics. And he says in his book specifically, it's not a valid model. There are, there are um, compounding factors that have to be accounted for if you're going to do it that way. Okay, so you can't compare turf grasses if you're going to if you're not going to randomize the turf grasses within the same location and because this was a shade study they have one shade level another shade level another shade level what they do is they put all the pots for one shade level under one cloth and then another one under a separate cloth and another one under the other cloth and they have basically they have four different studies under four different shade levels and then they merge everything together and then compare the different shade levels you can't do that the reason they did that is because in order to do it correctly, you have to have all these different shade boxes all over the place, over every individual pot that has that specific shade level. And that requires a tremendous amount of resources and time and effort and, 
And there's a lot of stuff that has to go into that. So they'll just create one large shade cloth and put all the pots underneath that one shade cloth. And that's not, that's not being picky. Okay. That's not being pedantic. Okay. That's being accurate. And, and the, the statisticians will support me on that. I'm confident of. So the reason I'm saying all that is to say, one, if you're in, if you're in science, if you're in grad school, grad, you're in graduate students or you're in grad school, you're a grad student and you're working with something, you, nested designs are not valid. Okay. Stop doing them. You, you cannot make that comparison. Okay. There's other ways to do it. Okay. You can still do what you want to do. You can still test and analyze what you want to test and analyze. It has to be, it has to be properly designed and it's not, you know, you have to design it correctly. And this wasn't designed correctly. So when they're going to start comparing shade levels, which I'm going to show you in graph format, you have to take that with what it is. There's some skepticism in there because you can't really compare shade levels. They didn't, they didn't randomize the shade levels. Okay. Um, so that's that. So now for all the people who don't want to hear statistics, that's, that's the majority of the, the, the statistics in this, in this episode. Okay. Um, before we get to the results and discussion, let me check the chat and make sure I didn't lose anybody with all that, you know, stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. So King Khan says the majority of DIYers probably wouldn't watch long videos, but the short clips would be key to reaching some of your research. Yeah. And I've, I've heard that a lot, King Khan. I, I hear what you're saying. You're not the only one who said that there's, you know, dozens of people that have also recommended that I do that. And I, I hear what you're saying and I'm, I'm going to respond to that. I'm going to do my best to condense things down to, you know, 10 minute, five, 10 minutes, something like that. So that it's more digest, easily digestible, but I just need time to do that. And that's the reason I'm changing the, the, the show from four, four a week to only two a week, because I, I don't have time to do that. To, to, I mean, I have a hundred episodes or something like that. And to go back and edit every single one down to five or 10 minutes is just going to take me time. But I, I'm planning on doing that. I'm trying, I'm working on that now. So, and Ignacio says the same thing. Yeah. So I, I, I hear you. And Eric Lickness says <laughs> long form any day. Nope. No problem. This is really more of a podcast. Just hang out and sit and listen to it. And but I understand for YouTube purposes, people have short attention spans and they want to hear it. You know. Um. Oh, Eric Lickner says. So, what does pound TIL mean? You have to. You have to understand. I'm. I'm not privy or knowledgeable when it comes to a lot of like social media stuff. <laughs> what you guys do? But he says nested design is not good. I wonder if. I wonder if you knew that before. I wonder if this is your area or if or. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. So we're going to continue. I'm going to read a couple things in results and I'm going to show everything in graph and PowerPoint. I think almost everything in PowerPoint, but I'm going to show a couple things at the beginning. Okay. So there's a couple things. This is the, the ANOVA table. And when you see the S times K, this is shade and potassium. And what we're, these are the, these are the, uh, the, the, terms the, the the variables shade and potassium and then s times k is the interaction and whenever you see an interaction what it means is is that you can't just say this happened under these shade levels you have to say this happened under these shade levels within these potassium levels because what it means is what happened under these shade levels how how shade affected turf grass differed based upon what rate of potassium you applied so if you say well this happened under shade well Yes, but under which potassium level, right? Because potassium influenced it or vice versa. This happened under potassium. Okay, it did happen, but under what shade level? So you have to account for the interaction. And they didn't do that sometimes. They did that in some cases in this um, paper, but not in all of them. Okay. And so I wanted to make sure that's clear. This is, this is the reason I'm saying this because I highlighted quality um, from trial one and tissue nitrogen in trial one because they're going to show this without accounting for the interaction, which is not valid. Okay. So I think, let me look here. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll get that in a minute. Let me go to the results under, under PowerPoint, and then I'll come back to, uh, to this. Okay. So the PowerPoint, this is the results. And what we're looking at here is St. Augustine grass quality influenced by applied potassium under different shade levels. This accounts for the interaction. This is the way it should have been shown. And it was shown this way, but it was also shown another way. And on the x-axis, we have zero shade, 30 shade, 50 shade, and 50 or 70% shade. And on the y-axis, we have turf quality for those listening. And we're going to be looking at the influence of zero potassium, point, uh, one pounds, a quarter pound, or a half a pound of potassium, how that influences turf grass quality under these different shade levels. And when we, when we, oh goodness, 
Okay. When we, <clears throat> oh, there we go. Okay. When we um, look at the 0% shade and we add more potassium, we actually see an increase in turf grass quality. So this is under full sun under the, in the first trial. And we see that the application of potassium increased quality from 5.9 to 6.9. And now yesterday we showed a study that showed no, no influence. Turf quality didn't influence. We've shown many studies that showed no turf, potassium did not influence turf quality when potassium was um, high enough in the soil. I don't know what the soil potassium was in here, so I don't know. But I suspect because of this graph, the sh zero shade, potassium was, was deficient. Well, clearly it was deficient or it wouldn't have responded. So it was deficient and it moved up um, and from zero at 5.9 at zero pounds to 6.9 at half a pound of potassium every month. But under, under the 30% shade, nothing happened. No, the potassium didn't influence anything. Everything is a seven, basically. Under 50% shade, everything is a seven. Potassium had no benefit, showed no benefit. And then under 70% shade, it went from 5.8 at zero pounds of K to 6.6 .6 at half a pound of K. So under 70% under shade, this indicates there is a little bit here in terms of you know, being convinced would potassium help you under a deep shade with St. Augustine grass in Florida. This was one trial. They showed this in, in under the first trial. Remember, there were two trials. So when I told that gentleman in Polk County, it's possible that applying potassium may result in a beneficial response on St. Augustine grass if it's grown in the shade. This is why I told him that. Okay. The, it went from went from six basically five point eight to six point six. You would see you would see that, you know, if you were a homeowner or a lawn care operator, you would notice that difference. Now the second trial, they didn't see that. The first trial they did. So, you know, that's the reason I don't have a lot of confidence in that. I don't I don't have a and, and by the way I don't have this these sorts of re, uh, results shown like this where it's one shade level another shade level. These are completely valid. It's trial one under this shade level. So even so, this is not this was not analyzed as a, as a split as a uh, nested design in this regard because they're separating out the different levels of shade. Okay, so this is this is very valid where you say seventy percent shade there was a benefit, but the other trial there wasn't. So that's what I'm saying. I you know I just don't have a whole lot of confidence that you're actually going to see this in reality, but it's possible. Let's go to the next one. St. Augustine grass leaf nitrogen influenced by applied potassium. So we're in shade levels on the x-axis and within zero all the way up to within 70% 70, 70 shade. And we have total Keldahl nitrogen on the y-axis. We're going from zero to half a pound of potassium a month. And we see there is a little bit of influence of potassium under these different shade levels. But notice under zero shade level, there was, um, there, uh, there was a little bit more nitrogen taken up by the leaf. When more potassium was applied, I'm right over here, guys and gals, a little bit more. But under 30% shade, potassium actually re reduced the nitrogen in the leaf. 50% shade, there was no effect of, of potassium influencing nitrogen in the leaf. And then 70% shade, there was an increase of nitrogen in the leaf. So there's, there's some inconsistency. When there's 30% shade, you actually see a reduction. When there's 70% shade, you see an increase. So that, that sort of inconsistency, and it's not the same trial after trial. It wasn't the same from one year to the next. That sort of inconsistency lowers my confidence. Okay, I'm not saying this wouldn't happen. I'm just saying that I would be more confident if I saw this consistently and, and regularly in the literature or within this particular study. And you, it, even this study is not consistent from one shade level to the next, or from one trial to the next. But it's possible under deep shade you might get more nitrogen in the tissue. It's also possible under light shade you might get less nitrogen in the tissue. You, you, see, you follow me? So, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> it's, it is what it is. Let's go to the next graph. St. Augustine grass yield influenced by shade. So we have trial one on the x-axis and trial two on the x-axis. And now we're going to look at different levels of shade. Now this is what I'm saying whenever, um, I should have printed that off. Let me go back to this. This might be valid. Let me look at this real quick. Under 
this is yield and yield there was no yeah the yield there was no interaction so this is valid yeah okay so um you were looking at the influence of shade so from zero percent shade up to 70 percent shade and trial one and trial two on yield and we see that in trial one we see that increasing shade from zero to 30 percent actually increased yield we're going to i'm going to explain that in just a second and then we see a decline basically for there thereafter from 30 percent shade to 70 percent shade we see a decline in yield and then trial two we didn't see any increase at all we only saw a decline as shade increased from 30 percent shade to 70 percent shade so we, we see a reduction in, in growth in yield there was a little bit of increase at the beginning of trial one okay I'm going to explain that when we get to leaf, the leaf sizes and so forth. But again, there's some inconsistency from trial one to trial two. So again, not a whole lot of confidence, but it's, you know, between this paper and some other papers that I haven't shown, I'm pretty, pretty confident that turf grass grown in the shade is going to grow less and have less yield than turf grass grown in the, in the sun. That's kind of what this is showing. Okay, now let's go to St. Augustine grass leaf length influenced by the shade the leaf length we have trial one and trial two on the x-axis and leaf length on the y-axis in millimeters and we're going to be comparing shade levels zero to seventy percent shade levels and in both trials very consistent this is what builds my confidence from zero percent shade to seventy percent shade the leaf length goes from 131 millimeters up to 226 millimeters in the first trial and 117 millimeters to 100 to 229 millimeters in the second trial, and each level of shade increases, results in an increase in turf grass length. And that's extremely consistent in the literature. Turf grass grown in the shade will generally will extend those leaves greater to try to absorb more light because it's light stressed. Okay? The reduction in light is stressing the plant, and in response, the plant is changing its behavior, its physiology to to extend out and to try to absorb more light. And you'll see this same response if you have any sort of plant in your kitchen window and there's a little bit of light and you turn it away from the window, it'll eventually start bending and towards the light. Phototropism, I believe is the name. I'm not a plant physiologist, but it'll start bending towards the light in, in an attempt to, to harvest more sunlight. And that's what this, these data are showing is that the leaf length is greatening. It's increasing the length. Of, and that's one reason why you want to increase the mowing height because the leaf length is um, growing and growing and growing, you don't want to cut it at the same height because you're going to violate the one third rule. You want to you want to increase the height under those shade environments if you want to reduce the stress to allow more of the leaf tissue to absorb light and to keep the stress from mowing as low as you can. You don't want to cut it the same height as what you would cut in the in the sun. Um, now St. Augustine grass leaf width. So he, that was the link. Now it's the width. The width is the exact opposite, where the width actually declines. As, as shade increases, the leaf width of this St. Augustine grass will decrease. So what it's showing is the leaves are thinning out. The, the, the thickness is, or the, the width is thinner, and the length is longer under shaded environments compared to non-shaded environments. Very, very consistent in this study, trial to trial, and very consistent in the literature from paper to paper. So I have confidence that this is very likely true. St. Augustine grass root weight influenced by shade. We haven't shown, I don't know if I've shown any work on roots in shade as it's influenced by shade. Um, but here we have trial one on the x-axis, trial two on the x-axis, and then a root dry weight on the y-axis. We're going to be comparing zero to 70% shade. And we see, as you might expect, the more shade you get, the, le the fewer roots you have, the less mass of roots you have. Trial one, there was a bump from zero to 30 and then a, a, a decline. But then from 30 to 70 in both trials, we saw a decline. So there's fewer roots when grass is grown in the shade. Very consistent literature and fairly consistent from trial to trial in this study. St. Augustine grass leaf length influenced by potassium. So now we're going to start looking at leaf length by potassium. And what I want to point out is what you just saw with, with the leaf length influenced by shade. It, it was very it was different at each level of shade in other words the influence of light had a major impact on leaf length and i want to i want to 
I want to refer everybody back to one of the early um, episodes I did on the, hier- the turf grass hierarchies of risks. And I have a pyramid where it's water, light, temperature, injury, and soil uh, fertility. And the risks are greater at the bottom of that. In other words, the risk of having unacceptable turf grass is greater with water than anything else and light and temperature and so forth. Okay, those are the things that influence turf grass growth greater than anything above it. Generally, the, 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 the components at the bottom of that pyramid will have a greater influence than the components at the top. Why do I say that? It's not just because I've been doing this for 20 years and 30 years and I saw it. It's because of stuff like this where I've seen data that shows turf grass is greatly influenced by light, as I just showed you. Okay, we had less and less light and we had major impacts on the, the, the leaf length, the leaf width, the root growth, and so forth. Quality, all these things. But now we're going to start looking at potassium. And I want, to know, I want you to notice how few differences there are when we apply potassium compared to the differences that existed under the different shade levels. So St. Augustine grass leaf length, we just showed light had a huge influence on leaf length. Now what happens with potassium? In trial one, we saw a little bit of an increase when we went from zero potassium to 0.1 and from 0.1 to 0.25, we saw a little bit, went from 174 millimeters to 189 millimeters. Probably not a whole lot biologically you would notice there, but there was a little bit of statistical increase. But in trial two, there was none. There was no influence. Potassium had no influence on leaf length in trial two. And, you know, statistically, but probably biologically insignificant influence in trial one. But the leaf length due to light was, was pronounced in every level. So that's what I mean when I say light has a more of an impact than fertility in most cases. Water is going to have more of an impact than fertility in most cases. We just don't see, you can see here, there's just not that much difference. There's or much impact from potassium on leaf length. When we go to root weight, St. Augustine grass root weight influenced by potassium. Remember, we saw root weight decline as we got more and more shade from light. Now, when we increase potassium, we did see a little bit of an influence during trial one. We went from 0.3 to 0.4 and from 0.4 to 0.5 grams when we went up from zero potassium to half a pound of potassium. So probably not a whole lot there. Biologically, there's not a whole lot going on there. I mean, biological significance. But statistically, they showed an increase. Trial two, there were no differences. None from potassium. So, you know, I just wanted, we're not, we're not comparing potassium and light necessarily in, in, in this paper per se, but I just want to point out that the, the, the influence of light was, was pronounced, very significant. The influence from, pota- from potassium is hit and miss. It's not that influential in this paper. When we do see some positive impacts from this paper, well, you know, clearly. Um, but sometimes we don't. But not with light. With light, we saw a difference almost every level. And that's all I have on that one. Hang on a second. Let me switch to this now. So that's all it has for the results. I'm going to go back to the paper and um, finish up a few things and we'll wrap it up and be done. So I just want to point out, unfortunately, that this paper... This is what I mean when they, you can't, you can't make these comparisons. They actually show the differences in quality by shade level. You can't do that because there was an interaction on these, on these particular components. Tissue KN and uh, TKN and quality up here, you'll see TKN uh, uh, and TKN and where is it at? A TKN right here. There was an interaction in quality. There's an interaction. So you can't come down here and start making comparisons among shade levels. Unfortunately, they did that here. It is what it is. And they did, they did the same thing here on potassium. You can't compare just quality of potassium in trial one because there was interaction between potassium and shade. But you can do it in trial two because there was, was no interaction. So here, it, when there was no interaction, increasing potassium result in trial two in, resulted in an increase in quality from 7.1 to 7.6. Okay. And tissue potassium went up a little bit, um, probably 1.9 to 2.0. So it's not much. But want to point out here is that the increase in quality in trial two, I'm not going to go into trial one because it's, it's, I don't think it's a valid comparison, but in trial two, 7.1 to 7.6, 7.6 quality when you went from no potassium to a half a pound a month. Okay. From zero K 
you had 7.1. A half a pound a month, you had 7.6. Would you recognize or would your clients or your coaches or your players or your, you know, members or golfers, would they notice any difference between a 7.1 and 7.6? It, you know, it's a half a point on the, on the quality scale. I doubt it. You know, I, I think trained graduate students could start to pull that out, maybe. But it's unlikely that an average person would be able to tell the difference between a, a half a point on a quality scale. Okay. But nevertheless, there was a significant statistical increase in quality following the application of potassium in trial two. Okay. So I want to point that out. <clears throat> so it's possible. Now we'll go to the conclusions and we'll wrap this thing up. From the results of these two trials, we can conclude that K may improve turf performance of Kativa undershade. Remember, they only showed that in one trial, in one of the trials, not in both of the trials. Okay. And it was only at the 70% shade level, but it could. That's the reason I told the gentleman in Polk County. I mean, it's possible. I wouldn't probably invest the potassium and money in that potassium. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it probably would. If it was my money on the line, I probably wouldn't do it. Okay. But if I had unacceptable turf grass and I was able to do, you know, diagnose it a little bit further and I became convinced that potassium might help, then there's some evidence here to support that, that management practice. Over all shade levels, turf had best visual quality score at the uh, half pound K rate, whereas zero potassium rate had the lowest quality score. Remember, even the lowest quality score was a 7.1, which was right up here. 7.1 right here. The lowest quality was still very acceptable. All right. But it did have the greatest. Seven, or the lowest. 7.1 was the lowest, and the, 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 the highest potassium was the highest. That's true. Increased shade resulted in greater thatch accumulation. I didn't go into that. Um, but they did have an increase in thatch in the shade. Turf visual quality score improved with moderate increases in shade. Remember, there was a little bit of an increase in quality when it went from 0 to 30%. Sometimes that can happen as the leaves begin to expand a little bit. And as a result of that light stress, the leaves can begin to expand and you actually can see a little bit better quality when there's a little bit of shade. So, and on some turf grasses, this doesn't account for all, this is not saying this is all on all turf grasses in all situations, but in some St. Augustine grass situations, you can actually have a little bit better quality if there's a little bit of shade. And they showed that in here on one trial, not the other trial, but it is possible. Turf under shade had higher leaf tissue, TKN and potassium concentrations. So I didn't go into leaf tissue because I don't really care about that so much. Um, but there was a little bit more N and K when, uh, in the tissue when it was in shade than when it was not in shade. Okay. So the, the, to sum up this, the, basically the whole study was, it was a, it was a greenhouse study conducted in over two years and it was a nested trial, which we can't really compare shade levels when we were doing it in the nest under nested shade levels. We can't compare shade levels, but compare shade levels, but they did whatever. And, um, what they found was that essentially the shade level had a significant impact and biologically pronounced impact on many turf grass physiological measurements, whereas potassium had very minor and it was only, and it was hit and miss. Not Sometimes they didn't see it even in one trial. The next trial, they did see a little bit of an influence when you increase potassium, but it wasn't much. Okay. So that's one reason why when I say it's possible to increase um, quality or increase some beneficial attribute to the turf grass by applying potassium to St. Augustine grass in the shade, it's possible, but I don't have a lot of confidence in it because there's inconsistencies within this trial, within this study, and there's inconsistencies in the literature from, from paper to paper. Okay. So I would still do some diagnosis and do some sort of triage of the situation before I went out and started buying a bunch of potassium, putting it out because, you know, you have some unacceptable turf grass in the shade. It's not going to turn your unacceptable turf grass in the shade into some ma magnificent lawn because you apply potassium. That's probably not going to happen. But you might see a very small benefit under some situations. That's sort of the take-home message. I'm going to read the chat real quick. Oh, TIL stands for... Oh, t oh today I learned. Thank you. I'm learning. <laughs> today I learned. TIL for me too. I learned what the acronym stands for. Randy from Bulgaria asks, will you consider to invite sometime turf physiologists to discuss some papers? Well, yeah. I mean, 
<clears throat> for sure. I mean, when I get to those papers, and you know, th th this is a ever evolving channel. I mean, you all kind of see the the pattern that I'm going into, where I'll do a week or two of just me going over papers, and I'm trying to I'll try to schedule someone else to come on and talk about their paper, and I have to schedule that a week or two out to, to account for their you know their busy schedule as well. But yeah, any any time I go over a paper. I'll eventually get into diseases and, and entomology and all those things that I'm not an expert in, but I'll go over the papers and where I can, I'll have those authors come on if they're willing to come on and, and discuss their, their paper with me for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And Samuel Asamoa says, I have a question on phosphorus. I want to know if applying a 10, 1, 10 NPK can build phosphorus levels in the soil after a while. Well, I, I don't know how to answer that question other than um, if you're in a, if you're, it depends on the soil. I mean, if, if you're, if you have a soil, let, let's say, for example, you have a, a mollusol. Let, let's take, um, um, uh, trying to, let, let's take a soil, let's take a soil from Kentucky, okay, where we have phosphorus levels in the hundreds of parts per million. They're already in the hundreds of parts per million. You wouldn't normally apply phosphorus in that case, but if you did, what, the question is, could you build up phosphorus levels? Well, when you already start at a phosphorus level so high and so inflated, you're going to have a minimal impact on it, okay? But if you have a phosphorus, a soil that starts very low, starting off 10, 15, 20 parts per million, maybe like 3 phosphorus, applying that one part per million phosphorus is probably not going to do much, but you're going to have a greater impact when the soil starts off very low than you would if the soil starts off very high. I, I, I have a great deal of skepticism if to say that that amount of phosphorus would likely result in some sort of you know um uh concern and buildup of phosphorus okay you probably would have very minimal impact on the amount of phosphorus in the soil building up however having said that what i'm more concerned about than that is the rationale why you would use that that's what you know whether or not you you know build it up and don't build it up that's a whole another scientific issue but epistemologically, how do you know that you need to apply that phosphorus? Because my definition of excessive phosphorus or too much phosphorus is any application of phosphorus to a soil or to a turf grass, I should say, that is not deficient in phosphorus or has not ever exhibited a phosphorus, defic phosphorus deficiency. If you've never exhibited a phosphorus, phosphorus deficiency and the turf grass is not currently doing it, showing its phosphorus deficiency now, then there's no reason to apply the phosphorus at all but the, the, the thought process the critical thinking skills that it took to come to that conclusion is what i'm interested in developing in the audience it's not whether it's one one unit of phosphorus or 10 units of phosphorus or 20 units of phosphorus or straight phosphorus that's another issue it's the reason why you chose to to apply it at all do you have a good reason the the potassium and the and the calcium and all this other stuff that's an economic waste in many, many cases. With potassium, there can be a harmful effect for sure. It can happen, but it's more of an economic waste. With phosphorus and nitrogen, we have to consider both the economic waste and the environmental risk involved from applying those nutrients when we don't need to. And Eric Lincoln says, thumbs up. We're, we're learning community. I'm learning community too. I'm learning. As you all can tell, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there slowly. All right, guys, I'll be back tomorrow. Don't forget, this is the last week of public uh, open uh, 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 episodes in the morning. I'll be on uh, Thursday night. The Thursday night show will, will stay public. And tomorrow will be the last, let's see, tomorrow's, yeah, Wednesday, tomorrow will be the last morning show open to the public. And then thereafter, it'll be only open, uh, the morning show will be only open to members. So please consider being a member if you want to watch the early, um, the morning shows, or if you want to contribute to Turfgrass Research, please consider that. And you can always go to Calendly.com and support the channel that way and you can get face-to-face -face, uh, consultation on whatever questions you may have about turf grass science i really appreciate everybody showing up i'll be back tomorrow morning until then be kind see you then